What's up, man? You there? Yeah, I see you. You look good. I got a gray beard. Thank you, man. You too. That nice red beard. Look like a Viking. I'm telling you. How's your day going, man? So, how's your day? Oh, you know, busy. How you been? Good, good. Just trying to grow some cannabis. That's about it. Trying to... How's that motorcycle doing? What year was that? That's a 1950 Panhead, bro. I bought that right after 2005 when I went right back into the Navy after right after you and I both got out. Yeah. I went back in and I bought that bike and it was three pieces of motor, a frame, and a tranny. Sounds pretty nice. How long did it take you to get, to get, get it together? years I've had it. It took me originally about six months to get all the parts tracked out. <laughs> to build it the way it looks now, it's, you know, been a process for years. It's my bike. How much riding you doing? Uh, not much this year. we kind of busy repairing the trucks and restoring the old cars and stuff. Yeah, Corona and all that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I live out in Royal Farm area in Florida, right outside a couple big towns, but, you know, everybody in my area has five to six acres, so, uh, you know, it didn't really affect us out here. We all live off the land still. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've been working from, from home in the bedroom, so it's not that big a deal, just doing trucking and stuff. Looking forward to move away from regular employment, you know? Yeah, bro. <coughs> So what is this Vets for Freedom thing you're doing? Well, bro, we're starting out right now. Yeah. And uh, it's we're trying to build a real foundation out of it, a one-stop shop for all, all veterans in America. You know, the VA is really, really not doing all it should do. There's a lot of vets who are misplaced. There's a lot of vets commit suicide, and really all they really needed was to get together with their the brothers and talk about it, you know, and that would have probably saved a lot of lives, but, you know, most of the guys are on medications now, and we just saw a real need to get together and start connecting, so it's starting out as a small foundation, we'll bring out a merchandise line, then we'll slowly try to build rehabilitation centers for vets. How was your transition out of the military? Bro, I mean, uh, my transition wasn't wasn't hard because I already knew what to expect. You know what I mean? But I still don't get along with most basic people because I have that mentality. You know, I was in the military for 11 and a half years. And, you know, I had a job. Everybody had a job. You knew where to be. You knew what to do. And when you get out, you know, you, you just have a different set of views than most people. So they get you aggravated. And you don't get along with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely experience so, I mean, changes. I mean, for me, the biggest thing was I felt a loss from being with people I've known since I was 18 to the time I was 30, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it seems like y'all are, are staying pretty active. What is this thing tomorrow in Alcala? Well, you know... I guess they're supposed to have a peaceful protest in Ocala. And we just, we're all going to, all the vets are going to go down there and make sure that there's no rioting happening. That there's no violence happening and this is a peaceful protest. You know, that seemed to work in a lot of areas where the vets have gotten together and done it. You know, with, like with Dan. And, uh, yes, he got all rallied up down there, you know. And, you know, while they're all loaded up, we are in Florida, working seal carry. We're not going to go loaded out like that. We don't feel the need to. But we aren't going to go down there for violence. We're going to go down there and make sure the riots start. We're going to go down and make sure the protesters get to say what they want to. Yeah, going out there with the, the long rifles, I mean, it's totally legal in Tennessee just because of hunting rules and things like that, but in Chattanooga, we've already had some issues with veterans getting arrested for carrying their long rifles and things like that, so 
Yeah, I, I always conceal carry when I go places, but when you're doing this uh, Vets for Freedom thing and you are showing up out there, at what point do you start thinking you're going to be labeled some kind of group? Are you familiar with COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program? Well, when it started out by Teddy yeah. Roosevelt... Well, when it started out by Teddy yeah, Roosevelt, they, uh, they were targeting basically just any groups that were going out for their, their liberties and things like that and kind of doing a smear campaign against them. And it was just a, just a big ball of shit. It's just, I don't know how personally a group can kind of form up and kind of prevent those kind of things nowadays other than, you know, if you're actually making real waves and doing real things that are positive it seems like it could be kind of construed through the counterintelligence programs to kind of make you look like shit, you know? Well, we are of the knowledge that it's going to happen. We didn't. We started off with it knowing that eventually somebody's going to label us a racist or try to say we're terrorists or try to say we're something that we're not. You know, we're just a bunch of veterans. And, you know... On top of going on there and protect our communities, we're going on. We're honestly trying to do other things like community service. You know, we want to start doing things in our community together, and stop with all this, you know, hate and discontent around the world. So we don't really care what you label us, because the reality is, how long are we going to sit around and let people label us and let let things happen in this country that shouldn't be happening? No, and I love the fact that you're getting out and see, like me, when I talk to people, I say like the big thing for me is. Facebook is kind of like yelling into the void. It's like, so what if everybody has a platform to yell out and nothing gets done unless you're out at city hall meetings, town hall meetings, actually showing out and meeting the people who you're voting for and knowing who they are and things like that. It seems like it's very much, it's just a kind of waste of breath sometimes. So yeah, I definitely love the fact that y'all are actually getting out and being active. You know, I think that's the only way to actually make some kind of impact. Well, I mean, yeah. There's so much hate being spread around now that, you know, it's ridiculous. You, you know, my kids are to the age where they're getting ready to be on Facebook, and I'm like, do I really want to expose them to this? Is this what I want to teach my kids? You know, I already homeschooled my kids because I wasn't happy with the programs that the school was teaching my kids. Yeah, and I, I'm you right know? there with you, and I think uh, <laughs> when people ask me about that, I'm always reminded of a meme, I believe you shared, it's like all the little blocks of wood in class and then you're sending in your fresh timber, you know what I'm saying, to be chopped away at and made into another block of wood, and yeah, that's why I homeschool, I'm not ready for my child to be made into a block of wood for this system that is failing, you know? Well, it's blatantly failing, and it scares me is nothing that's happening, happening right now hasn't already happened. And these kids that are in Antifa are younger kids that are coming out of college, and you can tell that most of them are didn't really go to college to learn super skill. You know what I mean? They're they're more of a liberal generation. And where did that get taught from? Because I wasn't taught that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that the think that people in their mid twenties they're calling for communism in America. And we have a state where American soil is being taken up by people who claim communism, and it's okay. Yeah. Right? Well, that shouldn't be okay. And somebody has to stand up and say some of this shit is bullshit. Yeah. And it's kind of a complicated thing, because the more and more I look at it, it's like a very very much uh and i think this is going to take us years to get out of this just because i think the guys who are in politics and in office right now are so greedy and corrupt and will never give us a straight face and a straight look at what's going on that you know how can you make progress with a bunch of back sabbers and deceivers and the whole front that they've got is a deception you know i spent several hours this morning looking through wikileaks and you know if, if everything that I'm reading in there is true, there's, like, there's some real, real deep issues, even on local mayors, you know what I'm saying? Because they talk about local mayors out in California 
that are just doing things that are just totally corrupt, but carrying that front as though they're not, you know. And even when they got into office, they thought they would get into a mayor's position with get out of jail free cards, you know. And so that gives them the the option to go do whatever the fuck they want, and do whatever they want, and then just keep going, you know. So when we talk about police getting away with crimes, I think it's don't forget politicians, you know. <laughs> Bro, I'm telling you, it's worse than that. I mean, that half of the prison system is a privately owned business. So, you know, and then everybody hates the cops, and the cops are all, hey, I'm not the bad guy, but let me tell you something straight out. When you're saying you fit the description of a suspect, which is a really broad thing to do a search on somebody, that's a, that's a violation of the Fourth Amendment right. Why are we violating the Fourth Amendment right? Because if we get that guy in the fucking private prison system, well, that that makes the whoever owns the prison system stop money, right? Like, it's so deeper than that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, because each of these problems kind of need yeah. addressed on an individual level. Even, like, the, the for-profit prison system. Because in my mind, it's, uh, I don't want citizens to have to pay to house criminals. You know what I'm saying? So when that since I understand making it a business so that we're not taxed to house and feed and take care of rapists and people who don't deserve to, you know, deserve the right to live for free, but at the same time, making it a business, you start walking a real fine line of let's start throwing people in prison just because we're getting paid for it, you know? And so... Well, yeah. And now... In order to control these prisoners that are getting put into prison and then they're getting extended sentences, most of them just for protecting themselves in prison. Now, they're getting so aggressive because they've already lost everything that they don't care anymore. Now we're putting them in, you know, shoes and locking them up for 20 hours a day. Now, how is that? How is that constitutional? Yeah. And it's definitely we, not... You know, we're looking at law... <laughs> I think that's my main problem with BLM. You want to address an issue, but you want to change the world and make a movement, right? But you're addressing one single issue in in a clusterfuck of issues. Yeah. So, you know. Because even as veterans... Yeah, as a veteran, you start thinking about a prisoner and that, that reintegration process into society... If it's hard on veterans, it's got to be pretty much hell on prisoners, too. You know what I'm saying? And So that's another another issue is how do you get people out of a system that's already been beating them up to come outside? So, yeah, a clusterfuck of issues. It's just when I, I guess we're at the head of it here in 2020 is what, what it's all come to. Yeah, so, like, I think it needs to be made clear up front. You know, the Vets for Freedom people, we're not... We're not one of them boogaloo-style groups. We're not here for that. We don't want a war. We don't want violence. We actually know what the fuck goes down. And that doesn't need to happen here, you know what I mean? But at the same time, there is a problem. So somebody needs to stand up that can see what's going on and knows what's going on and say, this is enough of this. You know, I might not be for defunding police, but there's no reason for them to have armored, armored personnel carriers in the comp in stage three fucking combat gear that they're walking around with yeah because there's really nobody in nobody in my community that needs that type of hardware like if you're if you've got an issue with somebody if they're like a, an opposing army there's nobody in chattanooga that you need that type of gear to go to war with you know it's the common citizen so I think at some point we're going to have to structure it to where the, the armed police and things like that are not dealing with the common citizen. That Those jobs are specifically for people who are dealing with gun runners or rapists or, you know, child traffickers or whatever. And that the common cop is not meeting both regular citizen and those people, you know, to where there's kind of... Like the bullshit that you and me might get stopped for, what, what maybe some loud pipes or something like that, you know? So... Yeah. That is definitely not somebody that needs an M sixteen or any any real type violent potential stuff to go down with, you know. 
Well, you know, we'll see what change we can bring as a foundation if we can draw everybody in. But, you know, like like you asked, from day one, we knew we were going to get labeled. We didn't care. It's time for people to stop giving a shit about their labels. People talk about this tracking and all this crap. They've been tracking you for years. This is all connected. It's always been connected. Everything's stored in the cloud. You know? So, if somebody doesn't stand up for something wrong and stop worrying about being labeled, then eventually nobody's going to be able to. Yeah, that's one thing as a citizen. I'm really trying to learn more how to get out into my community. Because I, even last night there was a there was a get together, a meeting with the mayor and the police chief and things like that, and I didn't know about it until thirty minutes prior, you know. And that time of day, I just couldn't drop what I was doing and go to it. So, but it, had I had at least three hours notice, I would have I would have made the the necessary provisions to be there and kind of understand what other people are talking about and what they're putting out there because I think we got to share ideas on a real area somewhere, you know. Yeah, and you know, so we're kind of trying to break it into states so that every state has notice of what's actually going on. Because most people don't even realize that you have to go find out the town hall schedule. It's not public, you know, it's not put out there for you. It's put out there for you to know, but if you want to know, you got to find it. You know what I mean? I should know when these town meetings are. I should know when these votes are. I should know what these proposals are. I shouldn't just be having a congressman trying to pass some bill that he hasn't even read because that's what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Whoa. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I'm hoping I can see some change this year. I, and But it comes with me. Like, I, I've drove out to Nashville several times and talked to my politicians and senators and been to the hearings and things like that. But even even that, that's a bit too much big, too big for me. You know, I'm talking. That's on the state level. I need to be focusing more on my cities and my local town and county and things like that. You know, because maybe in within that yeah. that reach, I can actually learn what's going on, know who to talk to, and actually take part in something that matters there. You know, because can't if you can't save the world if you can't start in your own city. You know, so. I mean, exactly, and here's the thing, I talked to a lot of vets for the last, let's say I retired in 2013, and I started paying attention to what was going on in 2008 while I was still on active duty, and over the years, I found out a lot of vets felt alone by themselves, and uh, out of touch, well... Well, they're feeling like that. Three doors down from them is another vet who feels the same way. And them dudes could be hooking up and having a fucking beer down at the pub, you know? Yeah. And talking about the good times and then go home feeling much better about themselves. Well, why should we let all these guys that we served with sit here and feel bad about themselves? How much better would the community be if these guys got together and cleaned the playground? Or took graffiti off the walls? Or took fucking drug power up and out of the fucking these bad neighborhoods out of the parks? Or erased all the racial shit that's written all over the fucking walls and shit in these fucking neighborhoods. Well, that would start making the community better, wouldn't it? Yeah. And who's leading the way to do that? You know? If anything little like that helps, and you'll get recognized for it in the community. Well, if the community starts believing in itself again, maybe we can get the whole system to believe in itself again and pay attention and get some of these corrupt motherfuckers who are only out to put money in their pocket out of office. And see, that's that's a that's a big step i think i think that big step on so many small communities would have a larger impact you know what i'm saying than trying to focus on the big picture focus on the small picture of your city because we're so interconnected that it actually is the big picture you know yeah there's so, there so many systems I mean, how many vets do you personally, bro, who have taken their kids out of the school system because half the shit in the history books is removed because they're trying to remove all this shit that offends everybody instead of teaching it? Because we need to learn and hear both so we know what really happened and how to move forward. But they don't teach that anymore. They teach you how to follow and be good and do what you told and only what does other people. That's bullshit. You don't learn from that. Yeah. 
even as far as the system goes, I guess I've been, I've been kind of focused on one thing lately, but it, it's it, my, my perception is business. It's like business to me is the the American freedom that I dream of just because I don't have an employer anymore. I'm not anybody's bitch. I'm not there to show up to work for them and make their fortune, you know. So, And I didn't grow up that way thinking about business. I grew up thinking I was going to get a job and work, but businesses provide me a chance to figure out what I love and what my passion is and turn money doing it, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's just being able to turn money on what you love is the, the way to go. Well, I agree. That's why I want to buy a bike from you one day because you're, you, you know, uh, was it buy, buy local or whatever, small stuff, small business. So. Yeah, well, my thing was I had been building bikes since I was a little kid. And then I went to school probably 15 years after I started building shoppers for my old man who built, built them his whole life. And uh, by the time I got out of school and certified and everything, hardly when you go to get a job and they want to hire $12 an hour and you've already been doing it for, you know, 20 years, you don't want to get paid $12 an hour. Especially when Harley charges you, what, between 80 and and $100 for the service hours, but I get paid $12 an hour out of that shit. Yeah. And then in order to make any money, I got to fucking do two or three bikes at once in order to fucking make enough money an hour to make it worth it. Well, who did I screw by fucking paying for a trade school and going to work for a multi-million dollar company? Screwed himself. Yeah. You know? So some point, at some point, I said, well, I've been building bikes and show bikes for years. If somebody wants me to build them a badass bike when I get enough money... And they realize the reality of what a 1950 panhead cost us, you know, all original. And they realize it's not going to be a $3,000 investment, it's going to be a $30,000 investment. That person will come find me and I'll build him a really bitchin' bike. Yeah. Yeah, that was a hard pill to swallow, too. <laughs> You'd like to build something cheap as hell, but it's just not doable. I mean, not for what most people like. They, they want to look at Easy Rider and have you build that bike. I mean, okay. That costs you money, bro. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's in the magazine. That's why it's in the magazine, isn't it? Well, the thing with that is that's all political and rigged, too. You ain't getting in the magazine last time you got them up. And you're friends with other people in Easy Rider and... You buy all your parts from J.P. Cycle or one of other main distributors, and you got people to do all the work. Yeah. I, I'm not in no magazine. My bikes are just as good as those. I got trophies all over the walls to prove it, but I'm not an easy rider. Yeah. You know, when I go to a bike show, guess who I'm losing to? Billy Lang or somebody like that. That's who's winning, even if my bike is just as nice as theirs, because they're the guy. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's the power of organization too. Yeah, bro, it really is. So, uh, what else? <laughs> what else? Uh, how old are you now? Oh, uh, we're not doing too bad, you know. I'm getting ready to tr move here shortly. I mean, they're moving somewhere like Alaska or. South Dakota. I'm looking really hard at South Dakota, but how old are you? I'm doing bad. Hmm? How old are you? I'm 37, bro. Okay, yeah, I'll be 37 this year. <laughs> yeah, man. So life has been pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. And I want to make sure. I want to make sure life. My kids have the ability to have a good life like I did. You grow anything on that on your this year? Did I grow anything? Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, we had a full garden going, but the fucking overcast skies where my garden is, and the rainstorms like killed all my tubulars. I've almost lost all my cantaloupe. My tomatoes, they got sick, and I just fixed them. So we got a few. Uh, Indian purple tomatoes coming up, some beef eaters, Roman tomatoes. But, uh, I think the carrots got another month and a half. So, yeah, we got a full garden going out there. This year, with kids got ducks, so yeah, we got, like four gigantic ducks. 
two baby turkeys and all that jazz going on. I'm pretty excited. I'm about to harvest my first first batch of hemp. We'll see how this goes. It's one of those things. It's like learning the plants, you know, uh, how much can they handle water because my pot plants take a lot more water than my hemp plants. My hemp plants get a little bit of water and they, 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 that's it for a couple of days, but my pot plants, man, I would drench them in water every day and it was fine. So having to learn these little kinks on the way out, it's it, it can be frustrating, but it's still fun. I'd rather be dealing with these headaches than the headaches of a boss, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But uh, it's cool, right. man. I love it. Yeah. I started my gardening is like right after I got out because my plan was always to head up to Alaska eventually. But, you know, as Why? I'm getting older. Why Alaska? Changing. Originally, bro, Alaska is like free as hell and nobody's there. You okay. know, property's very cheap up there and it's untouched. Nobody's, you know, nobody's homesteaded it before. You can get it for you get 20 acres for 20 grand up there. Yeah, but you're a Florida yeah. boy, though. Don't you like that hot, humid weather? Can you deal with that cold no. weather? Bro, it feels like we're in the golf every day of my life. Yeah, it's set in today here. It really sucks. Because we're on a peninsula here, so we have the humid heat like we did in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. And so it's 95 degrees and you're sweating at fucking 7 o'clock in the morning and it's like that. Like in the summertime, I don't work as hard because I'm in the house in the middle of the day and I work all night. And like in the early morning. Yeah, because there's a certain amount of cold. Like Colorado, Colorado cold I like, but Michigan cold is, I, that sucks. It's, I mean, they both get a lot of snow, but Colorado you still get like warm sun up in Michigan. It's just gray and cloudy and windy and just cold and miserable. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, that's why we're kind of looking at Sturgis, because as me and my wife get older, we're getting to the realization that if I move to Alaska, I might shop wood when I'm 80 years old, and that's just not a fly. Yeah, yeah, good you know point. I mean? So, then, you know, South Dakota, it's cold up there, and I got Sturgis every year. Yeah, I've still been wanting to go so, to that one year. That's, I ain't made it out there yet. I think I'm, I know I drove under South South Dakota. Yeah. So, but I got my, uh, about my truck about 50% done once that gets done. Oh, and I enrolled in welding school, so I got 10 months. Is that GI Bill or is that just out of pocket? No, nah, the, the GI Bill's paying for it. I'm going to use the remaining balance on my GI Bill to pay for it. So, Yeah, I still got to so. close mine out. I went and got a biblical studies degree and didn't really work out. But, I mean, you know, hey, I think uh, it works good for for uh, running a blog. <laughs> I learned how to write, use a computer, post. <laughs> <laughs> 